already. Hello. Don't mind me, I'm getting a bunch of stuff set up. I believe my audio is working, although I might just do just as well to turn it up a bit or not, because maybe it's just fine. Hey, <clears throat> we've got laptop and I've got a variety of stuff to do as far as setting things up. So don't mind me getting this ready and going five minutes later than I normally would. Hey, oh, look, it's dark. Not really. It's me fooling with the controls. I don't have any lights on. You know what? I'm not going to turn any lights on. I'm going to set it up with the uh, controls. And that's how this is going to work. There we go. Good enough. And I got to do my picture in picture. There it is. And that's good enough for rock and roll. Or almost, because I also have to uh, get my chat going, because that's something I usually do. We're going to do our bandpass filter today. There's Chad. <laughs> Already. Good enough. Um, and a quick little test on whether we can hear stuff off of this machine. Yep. Okay, a little shuffling around of keyboards and things, and we should be ready to go. If I'm a little in low energy, it's because I beat myself up real bad doing all those VST plugins. And there's going to be more of that, but I mean, uh, once I'm finished doing them, then it's just another two elaborate things to do when releasing every new plugin, rather than having to do hundreds of them in retrospect. Uh, here, more stuff that I'm working on. I'm not going to worry about this right now. Only that it is in my way. Uh, let's see. I am just fussing with the controls all day long. Hey, Jazz. I'm going to say that is about uh, ready to go. Keyboard over here, mouse pad over here. Drag this thing over. You might be able to hear a background noise, which is I also have to do laundry, which is uh, why I'm in this uh, silly heavy bathrobe, although it is cold out here. Um, up in Vermont, it has been a bit of a cold wave, so it's like to the point of having to run heat. The funny thing is, um, even though I'm having to run heating, I am also already trying to set up 
my place with better cooling because um, I have no intention of like sticking air conditioning everywhere. So what I'm doing is getting a uh, sort of bathroom exhaust fan, like a large bathroom exhaust fan with an enormous squirrel cage blower and uh, that uses what, six or eight inch uh, ducts. And putting in the basement and running a duct up into a hole in the floor in the room where I'm in now. And if I do that, I can get uh, basement air. Somebody mentioned radon. It's like, well, I hope you don't have a lot of radon down there. And I'm like, I hope I don't too, because I don't have many other options here. So uh, I guess we'll see, won't we? Um, but the air in a basement is going to be cooler than the air on a massively hot summer day in a regular house. And if I have another blower in the attic pulling air out from the top of the house, that's something that actually works fairly well. That and keeping the place uh, thermally locked up tight like you don't have all your windows open or anything. And then the remaining thing is uh, pulling blinds and uh, stopping summer sunlight from getting in because if summer sunlight gets in, place will heat up like crazy. It's a very powerful energy source that is. So yeah, let's fire up a why do I not have X I do have X band pass right there. Okay, so let me move around my things a little bit because I'm confused. Okay, I decided I was going to try making notch filters because I have no idea what they're going to do. I thought I knew what it was going to happen, but I was mistaken. I thought that when I did the high pass, it was going to be a, a distorted output and that I knew what was going to go on. And instead, it made laser zaps. So I'm not entirely sure what the band pass is going to do, and I'm not entirely sure what the notch is going to do. But we're going to be not entirely sure together and see what happens with this stuff. And I'll start with this. These are all kind of moved over. I appear to have the old version of these and I'm not sure I'm going to want that. So maybe what I might want to do is open a recent project or open something directly because I think some of that might be VSTs. I'm a little slow this morning because I can't really get jacked on coffee constantly without making myself really sick. So to some extent, I'm going to be just derping along through this stuff and I'll do my best with it. There are some days when you can't crank at full intensity. You kind of got to pace yourself a little bit. We're doing the traditional Mac I use because I always start my stuff with the retro build on the retro computer. It's not as retro as it might be. I could be composing this stuff on a G3 or a G4, but I'm compiling to target G3 or G4 here. This is, I think, more like an i7. Let's find out about this Mac 1068 and an Intel Core i5. 2.53 gigahertz, which back in the day, that was very impressive. Copyright 2011 Apple. Ooh, 10 years old. I'm going to want to go for the X low pass rather than the high pass to start this off with. 
So one of the things I know is I'm going to want to include this other by quad. And the reason for that is that when I started this out, I thought I'd be able to do a dry wet that um, went from dry to full four poles of filtering. That's not actually correct. What I'm going to want to do is a dry wet that can go from one to five poles of filtering, and then another dry wet, which is dry versus the ultimate end result of all the filtering and distorting and stuff, because that's just going to be more useful to people. There is some benefit to doing the, uh, let me move things around so that I can see my, there we go. I'm definitely getting some background noise, but that's no biggie. I wanted to see my meter so that I can always glance over and see that uh, my audio is still working. So with only the four by quads, I had it set up so that it went from dry to one pole of filtering and from one to two poles of filtering and two to three, three to four. And that is a way of kind of acting like you have a progressive slope without actually manipulating the Q factor. You're throwing on more poles of filtering, but every stage you're adding a new pole, it's like a little section of dry wet versus whatever the previous poles were and including the results of the new pole. And particularly with something that does distortion and weird effects, that's got its handiness to it. It's nice to be able to blend these things. But it does mean that you can't have a like two and a half pole filter distorting just right and then sneak in a little bit of dry signal. And so that's why I'm adding the fifth filter so that none of the new control can be dialed back to purely dry. It'll always dial back to just one pole of filtering and it'll go up to a total of five if you want. And that's probably going to be more understandable in general to work with. We might also grab these controls because this is what I was using before. And this stuff is clearly not updated to reference it. We're leaving some of these other controls here so that if I need to dial in a number, I can do it by ear, which is something I consider important. Oh, also, if I'm coughing up chunks, I told you about not being in very good physical condition after some of this stuff. And that, oh, let's save that. I take stuff called Mucinex for if um, my lungs aren't behaving themselves properly. Uh, sometimes uh, summer is problematic for that, like there's too much pollen and all of a sudden you're coughing a lot. And let's keep on with this rather than chattering about dismaying crop. That'll give us instantiation for all of the things I'm doing. Uh, 24K is asking, I want to learn how to code and start coding. Where should I start? Um, you know, there's a number of things that you can do. It depends what you want to do. Like, it's a fair, code is a very generic term. You could be making web pages. You could be doing video games. You could be doing audio. Um, I'm currently doing audio, but I've also done video game stuff as well. And uh, not commercially, but experimenting with them. I would have to say if you're interested in coding and you're really kind of new to that stuff, one possibly fun way of doing that might be to download the Godot engine, 
that's an open source game engine that runs on Macs and Windows and Linux and is very accessible. And that acts as its own little um, its own little Xcode, its own little uh, development environment. So you just run it and learn how to operate it. You'll be doing coding in order to make stuff happen. Uh, ah, audio plugins in specific. Uh, what I would direct you to do then is try to get some kind of format building for you. And by that, I mean get set up with something that acts like a template or whatever and is making a functioning audio plugin, for instance, that just does gain, like it just makes stuff louder or quieter so that you can get into the zone. Because a form, a template will give you stuff like this, like what you see here. Uh, some of this stuff I did not code. Like that, what I've got selected here. I didn't code this stuff. This is part of the template from old audio units because I'm a Mac programmer, so I start with these. There's also VSTs, and they come with sort of pre built things where if you can make the compile work and get a plugin on the end of it and put the plugin into your software and use it, that's basically what you need to start. So, and that's actually, that, that is where I'm not at my best. What I do is all this other stuff down here. And I rely very heavily on the fact that I have a template that I work from that already starts out and works. Like here, I can even show you that right off of the, because there's no real reason not to. Um, we'll call it untitled because we're just going to throw it away. I just used a template. And this produced an audio unit. And it's I called it untitled, so it started everything out being untitled. And it starts with stuff like this. I'm going to move it so that you can see it. My template starts out with the stuff already put in. But it also starts with stuff like this that I didn't put in, that the regular audio unit stuff from Apple gives you this already. This is what they want you to use. You have these uh, functions called get parameter value strings and thus and so. These things that the program can do. And a place to put variables in. Something called virtual void process, which is where the audio is, is done. And you've got stuff like here, where this is my controls again. I set those up. Uh, this is how you tell the controls what to be. And you go down here, like this is something that wasn't in the Apple version, but um, Sophia Poria from Destroy Effects many, many years ago uh, gave me this bit of code for instantiating stuff. And it's reset. I have these templates downloadable off of my GitHub. I can't necessarily talk you through getting them to work for you, but everything that you see here is something that I have available to download. You just can't use my identity for it. I have a, uh, in fact, the stuff that you download off of the web page has that stripped out. And then this is process. And process is basically stuff like this, where we start out with process which does everything in an audio buffer and we've got assorted things like this is a quick way to get at controls and then this is the process loop and audio is done like this it's counting down from this number which is an integer 32-bit integer u means unsigned so it's an integer from 0 to who knows what in frames to process and every time you call this, you give it a couple of buffers of samples and the number of how many samples there are in the buffer. 
and it'll go from there. With the AU, you also give it the number of channels because AUs can do like 5.1 and quadraphonic and all that kind of stuff just out of the regular plugin automatically. And we're counting down the number of samples until they are zero. And getting an input sample from what the uh, buffer says, because the buffer is getting incremented each time. This bit is me making sure that it doesn't have denormalized numbers in it. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is a gain plugin. So this is an audio plugin. It works with these that are input samples and it assigns them to the output buffer and it multiplies the input sample number by gain. Everything else is just more complicated versions of that. Let me throw that away while I'm at it. So where we're at with this is I'm looking it over and figuring out what I need to uh, incorporate from this was my previous X low pass filter and what we're going to do is take it and do a band pass version of it and see what we need to change and I may very well I'll, I'll get something that you can hear by the end of the stream I may have it finished by the end of the stream or I might not but I'll be doing a bunch more programming this week because it seems not unreasonable that I could get the uh, VSTs done this week as well. I got more than half of them done and that's always kind of encouraging. It's like, wow, rather than hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, I've got like maybe a hundred more to do and I can sit sit down and put on like Bausch debating Sargon of Akkad or something amusing like that that is not overly distracting, but engaging, and just start walking through the process over and over again. It's tricky because I have to do every little step right when porting everything. If there are missing pro missing steps, or if I don't do the complicated sequence of things exactly right, then they won't build properly, and there will be bugs in some of the uh, VSTs. So it's kind of stressful, but it's also kind of mindless. And 24K, I think that's a very good idea. It is not only easy to combine maybe two of my plugins and create a new plugin with functions of both, it's allowed because my plugins are MIT licensed open source. So technically, you are allowed to do that and then call it yours as well as you also call it mine. So that is absolutely, that's why this stuff is open source. Feel free to do so. Go right ahead. There are many opportunities for people who want to do plugins. For instance, um, nothing is stopping people from doing, say, uh, VCV rack versions of these plugins. There's somebody out there who's already done some of those, but they don't have to be the only one. Or learn how to program in, say, Juice, the GUI framework, and start doing GUI versions of that. That would be completely allowed. Reason I'm not doing it is I can't wrap my head around juice and it's a lot of extra work and I'm keeping the DSP stuff coming and covering a lot of ports. I'm covering a lot of bases as far as possible computers that my stuff can run on. So that keeps me pretty busy, honestly. I'm not really frantic about like, now I need to plug port all of my plugins into uh, elaborate GUI formats like, Maybe not. Um, and you could indeed do that for the convenience too. That's fine. So now let's see what we've got here. I was in the middle of doing this, although probably that conversation is more important, but we can do both. Uh, so here's my band pass. Here's what I've got so far. You know, I could probably just grab everything here and go from there. See, this is a process, but everything from here downwards is going to be consistent with what I've got. 
any other things. So one thing that I can do as far as combining two of my plugin codes, here's something that I'm going to do. I'm going to take everything from this plugin code and just paste it into the other one. Because I've got this stuff set up so that the instantiation is right. <laughs> Can I at least port all my plugins to Amiga? That's a really amusing thought. I'm not sure that Amiga can handle them, but if it could, that would be most delightful. I'd love it if somebody did that. I'm not sure how many of them you would be able to. Let's do this so that I can get rid of uh, X low pass CPP. Because I know one of the things I'm going to be doing is, see how it looks kind of similar because it's kind of similar to what I was doing. What I'm going to want to do, here's expand pass, where's the X low pass? Sitting right here, okay. I'm going to want to dig up my code for how this becomes a uh, bandpass filter. Now as far as the denormal number being a bit overkill, um, I hadn't really thought of it that much. It is, uh, let's see now. I think I calculated it out to what a 32-bit number would be doing. I mean, if it's wrong, I have an awful lot of plugins to update, so that is not necessarily happening in any anytime soon. But um, I'm not really shooting for any particular DB down so much as I'm shooting for make denormalized numbers not be happening. Short of that, I don't want to gain anything. Short of that, I don't want to engage it. Remember that my um, audio bus is long double. So talking about overkill to me doesn't really go very far because it's like, what is overkill anyway? I, will, I would rather spend extra processing power on doing insane overkill on the word length than say doing a GUI or, or coding stuff inefficiently or something. So uh, not really worried about that. That said, if you wanted to do a version of it that had a different denormal number, that would be fine too. That's why this stuff is open source. So let's see, first of all, let's go open up a project that contains my uh, band pass code. Okay, you, the original biquad should have all of that written down and indeed there it is. So this is what I was doing for getting the accessible reference to this stuff is it's sitting there in the code. The biquad filter permits this um, different forms. I have a band pass, I have a notch, in fact, at the bottom of all this, I have some commented out additional things, which are, you know, this is a peak filter, but I would prefer to build peak filters out of doing a bad pass and adding it to dry, or doing a bad pass and dry wetting it between uh, dry and entirely notch. So I don't really wish to build a dedicated peak filter that only boosts and leaves everything else effectively dry. I'd rather do it by keeping dry as a long double number, doing everything else and then crossfading them. That's how I prefer to do it. Uh, low shelf and high, high shelf, kind of the same thing. Like I'd rather do stuff um, like constructive solid geometry is in 3D modeling, where you're cutting stuff away and then blending them rather than trying to generate stuff directly as a single burst of code. But that's, uh, that's another question. The real question here is, let's make a band pass. So we'll copy that out of there. 
we can leave this term out of the bandpass, and I think we're going to be doing exactly that, because by quad 3 equals 0, that means that we do not have to do this part. Instead, what we do is just have negative temp sample times by quad 5 plus by quad 8, or it could be by quad 8 minus temp sample plus by quad 5. Any of those things should basically work. So back over to band pass, we've got this, and we want this. So this was the low pass, and there's something further that's happening here, which is we never assigned by quad A1, because we're building all of these things out of the Butterworth filter. Butterworth filter means resonance is always going to be 0 0.7071. So we're hard coding some of that stuff in. Anywhere it says by quad one, that goes there. And by quad zero and one only exist up here to assign values to this, these other ones, which are used in the actual algorithm. Having done this, this is now basically just, well, no, this is negative whereas this is positive. So we do have some changes. Some of these things aren't changed. Some of these things are the same. But other parts of them are altered. And again, this is altered. Changing this part makes it become a, by a, by a band pass rather than just a low pass. If you ask me how it does that, I don't know. It does, though. That means we don't need this anymore. And that means we have a working bandpass filter now because this will work just fine even when by quad four and um, by quad three is zero. So let's test that assumption. I know that I'm gonna be converting it over to the simpler algorithm because otherwise every sample I gotta divide something by zero and that's a useless uh, thing to do. If it's always going to be zero, then we just leave it out. Mind you, if you're doing a regular biquad filter that needs to do multiple purposes, you wouldn't do that. Instead, you would just leave it be zero because then it's more multifunctional. Here's my X band pass. Components is the correct place to put it. And Let's fire up uh, my old faithful drum track. And what's going to go on here is it may or might not be doing what we want. Like here, let's... By contrast, this is what we had in X Low Pass does this. Hey, our sound. Somebody's already commented on that there's a crackly noise, but people don't seem to be thrown by that too much, which is good because the X low pass and band pass, etc., are meant to be simpler to approach. If I start doing stuff to deal with this zipper noise, that's going to make the whole thing more complicated, and I'm going to avoid that where I can, although it might enter into doing uh, Y low pass. and my amplitude changes with these things as well. So the question becomes, what have we got out of our uh, air windows? Scroll down past all of these things. And X band pass. And the answer is we're about to find out. Let's see what we got. And one answer is, I ain't hearing anything yet, so let's find out. Um, I shouldn't have said divide by zero. I think it multiplies by zero. If it does divide by zero, that's why we're not hearing anything. But uh, I think we might need to do effects of some kind, because what we're hearing right now, this is what I just coded. 
but it, it no Mickey a noise that's not great. So let's stop and go find out what we did wrong. Oh, that would be, uh, Jas, you might have just spotted something that I didn't. Check this out. Remember how we didn't do anything about BiQuad A1? Replacing it with 0 0.7071. I think I didn't notice that in the low pass, that BiQuad 1 is here and here. So I replaced those with 0 0.7071. In order to make this work, I need to put it here as well. This is also the resonance calculation. Having done this, we are now dividing by 0 0.70071. Now, I don't know that by quad one, and actually, no, I should, because check it out. That would definitely make it be zero. So I did the calculation of this, did it divide by zero? It didn't seem to actually crash. It somehow ran, I don't know how but I got no audible output from it. And that would be why I missed a place where I needed to put the hard-coded value in. Now we should be able to hear it. A very, very simple uh, problem to stop there. Okay, dry wet works. Gain is doing nothing for us. Frequency and nuke are doing nothing for us. I'm trying to see whether the number down there that I'm obscuring with my screen does anything. No, we still got silence. Did I copy it over? I think I did. Let's see what else is going wrong. Um, I'm going to be keeping an eye on... By, oh, hello. I see a problem. Oh yeah, I see a major problem. Do you see the bug? I don't know why it worked, th why, am I, oh, I'm talking louder for some reason. I don't know why it worked this way, but, now do you see the problem? We're assigning this stuff to by quad A, but for whatever reason, oh, and I know why. See, this is easy. This is why it's going wrong. I copy pasted this over from the original biquad filter, but the original biquad filter isn't doing its calculations on biquad A to make its coefficients. So that's a really simple, silly bug. I needed to do this. All of these should be calculating on biquad A, which then we go and assign that to all the other ones, including the regular biquad filter. So there's your problem. There's your problem. I thought I was being very clever by spotting this one, but nope, there was more. Compile 30 million VSTs and get tired, and sometimes that's what will happen to you, is you'll miss the really dumb, obvious stuff. I am reasonably confident that this will now work. I'm not placing any bets, but I got a suspicion that that was such an obvious catastrophic bug that we probably 
have audio. And indeed we do. The way this is voiced is not great. Like you'd want the highs to take up less space. This is all highs and that's not great. However, we are able to do this low frequency stuff. Now let's start finding out what happens when we nuke. We're getting a bit of a combination of the two things, in fact. Low pass has a very distorted quality. High pass makes lasers. So this combination of the two There's another factor in here as well, which I'm noticing, which is that I'm plainly hearing the laser effect because this is using the uh, X low pass distortion code. So we have it set up where minimum nuke, only one stage of filtering is not too out of control. I got to fix that frequency slider. The more nuke we put in, the more layers of filtering we're applying. All of the filtering is Butterworth. All the filtering is resonance 0 0.7071. But you layer that and you start getting a steeper filter. That's what we're hearing now. And as we increase gain, we start getting this swoopy noise and that's what the distortion sounds like. But since we're doing the um, soft clipping from X low pass, like we had to get rid of that for X high pass because it made everything turn into lasers. I feel like maybe in band pass form, it's more workable, but you definitely get a uh, super intense overtone here. So what I'm going to be shooting for is ways of getting different tonality out of this as it goes. And we've got some of that, I just hate the way that this frequency is adjusted. Like it's not useful to me to have this entire range be super high frequencies and then no access to the low frequencies. Another thing about it is that it might be good to exaggerate the low range enormously because I'm also hearing a loud hum from somewhere, but maybe I'll just have to ignore that. Probably my washing machine. Hey, Definity. Uh, let's put this away. And I'm sufficiently annoyed by the loud hum. I'm going to take a moment and go wander about for a second. Excuse me.
Uh, no worries, you're fine. See, the deal with that is if you have a normally working recording studio and a piece of equipment that's normally like and then your piece of equipment, your your gear um, is suddenly going that might be the sound of something that's going to catch on fire or blow up but it wasn't that, it was my washing machine off in the distance and it did certainly make a loud 60 cyclish hum but that's coming from elsewhere and it's supposed to be doing it so no, no biggie Let's start dealing with some of this stuff. Biquad A0 goes from 0 to about um, 0 0.5. It is indeed using a sine lin wave folding. So let's, uh, firstly, if we exaggerate this power function, we'll make it so that it gets away from the high frequencies a lot quicker. The high frequencies are what we're getting out of uh, end result values that are closer to 0 0.5, and that's at uh, CD rates. Whereas um, 0 is low frequencies on by quite a zero and we're also going to add another zero to this getting us into really big subsonic frequencies that can become a very small frequency but where we have that placed is going to determine what the feel of the thing feels like so that has just changed some of those things oh no washing machine vst no plans on that we're also going to be changing some of this stuff around too How many bicoids am I using? There are five here. This one's always there. And then A, B, C, and D are added in succession with one control that's like a dry wet control that kicks in additional um, bicoids as you need them. Which also means if you have it at a low nuke setting, you're not using as much CPU. It is not doing the calculations unless it needs to. And that's handy. And 0 0.7071 is a Butterworth roll-off. What that means is if you're doing a low-pass or high-pass filter or something like that, that is as much steepness of roll-off you can get without creating a resonant bump at the edge of the roll-off, like rolling off and then stopping versus making a bump and being like peak and then rolls off. It's something I've been fooling with in a variety of different ways. Um, this is just one of them. And you can see that this is the sine len wave folding, but it's clipping to the maximum value. So what we're doing is we're putting this in, and if the sample we're working with is larger than what sine would convert to 1, we're just clamping it at that. So it's a soft clip. It's the softest of soft clips you could possibly get, but it'll, it'll stop at the maximum rather than continuing to wave fold around. If I leave this off, which is what's going to happen with um, the uh, Y filters. The Y filters are going to be about, um, why would you do that? And they'll be full of incredibly nasty noises. But it might also work on incorporating some stuff that'll clean them up in certain ways, like the Y filters might be where I start putting in the uh, having multiple levels of um, filter coefficients, because the way that filter coefficients work in the EMU uh, filters is that they'll do sets of coefficients, like one co one set of coefficients that does one thing, another that does another thing, and then in the calculation you get to crossfade between the two. That's what they call z-plane morphing filters. Is 
I guess the z-plane would be, are we using this biquad 2 or are we using the biquad 2 from another filter shape? Or are we blending between the two? And it'll be a thing kind of like that. At the point that I do that, we're probably going to be making a whole rearrangement of how this looks because it'll become an unreasonably big line of code. You just expand it outwards like that. Uh, wave folding is essentially what you get when you go beyond the clip factor. Without uh, clipping at maximum level, it's not really wave folding as I understand it. We're just defining a, 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 a soft clip this way. One of the things about biquad filters I have found is that it is nigh impossible to do anything like what you suggested of taking a feedback from the fifth back to the first and so on, because they just basically flip out and make large popping noises and go to infinity. They are awkward to fool with in that way. Um, now let me see, I have uh, changed this. I'm gonna, I might end up getting into one of those zones where I'm talking about what I'm doing, but I'm not using my words because you can use words to describe some of these things. But then when it's like, knob doesn't move nicely and I need this particular kind of rumble in the low frequencies, you wind up changing stuff, maybe changing stuff lots, like clip factor comes from here and goes to here. All of these things are about increasingly boosting the gain as we go so that it'll distort a little more each time when you have multiple layers of filtering. We turn up the nuke and we get a more aggressive sound. I doubt delay would. Delay never solves feedback problems, it just moves them around. Trust me, I can do something insane with this. Don't worry about it. Um, so we're looking at clip factor. Clip factor B in the thing that increases on our gain. And one thing we might want is to have it be more aggressive at higher frequencies. So get parameter three is our nuke parameter. That's how much we add to stuff times 32 is adding lots of gain. It starts at one and we're just adding stuff that's continually being divided by small numbers. Like if parameter three is zero, all of this is gonna be zero. If by quad A, which is the frequency we're rolling off with, is at zero, then all this is also gonna be zero. There will be no additional boost between levels. So the question becomes, like what happens when we do this? Here's another thing where it gets into that left brain versus right brain thing. Uh, sometimes you need to do stuff that isn't easily explained by uh, left brain words. We go clip factor is acting like this. If I took out this, what do we get? And one of the things I can do is simply do it and see what happens. This is our frequency. It becomes smaller when we are uh, at lower frequencies. So more gain would be larger. So at higher frequencies, it's going to be louder. But also this is multiplying our frequency setting by quad A0 by itself. So it's always going to make it way smaller. And then it's by the nuke factor. If I take this out, our gain's going to go way up, especially at high frequencies. So we're going to see what we get. Because I feel like X bandpass is one where it might be advantageous to have nuke be real aggressive. And we can always go back to a uh, nuke of zero, which will always cut that off to nothing. So as a result, this is what we've got. We 
we've got gain here. Frequency is here. It still goes up high as we need. I feel that this is, seems basically acceptable. One of the things we're noticing here is Freak is going down to a low frequency, but one of the things that's happening with that high pass code when we're distorting inside this algorithm, it's boosting up the frequency of the artifact that we get. And I'll show you that like this. Now, since we're doing a soft clip, it's always doing it at least a little. So what we've got now is kind of like an envelope filter. It's making a sort of twerpy noise, and it's coupled to how hard that kick drum hits. So if we turn it up, we can hear it's like punching into the mid-range when it does that. And this is a useful thing to do. As we continue pushing harder, we push higher and higher up into the mid-range. And then we crank it up all the way, and it's constantly exciting that uh, artifact there. We're also getting a massive peak as well, because I think we have gain control that's associated with nuke or something. Now here's another experiment to try. If we turn on nuke, we start getting a more aggressive sound. The question is how much? And the answer is we have too much gain in nuke. So we are certainly getting more gain by increasing it each time. But we're getting so much of it that not only are we pushing a subsonic wave here, because this is even at very low gain settings here where we're not driving it very hard, we immediately start getting into an ugly zone. Whatever it's doing there, and I'm not positive it's, well, I can find out by, that does sound like there's DC in there. So I would say something about this is catastrophically not working. And what we get with clip factor and bi quad A, taking out the additional level of bi quad A here it becomes too much. So let's take the overall multiplication of everything out a lot. Clip factor might be just increasing stuff far too much. If we make it be just times two instead of times 32, the whole thing scales down. And we can see what we get out of that. It's also possible to assign that to another slider and then just start dialing it in and out, which might even be good, particularly if we have a particular range where it blows up, and then another range where it's still basically fine. Back into the breach. Now let's see what Nuke does here. This is still working. It has a real tendency to make a note here. See, I like some of this, but the note... Also, one of the things I was trying to accomplish we're not actually boosting, and I think I know why. I think I went the wrong direction here. 
This is making stuff way smaller when the uh, frequency is low. So if I want it to be way larger when the frequency is high, which is what I was after, rather than taking out one of those functions, what I do is multiply it even more. And I can go back to the 32, it might not be remotely enough, but what we're doing here is when we have a relatively small factor, like some small number in here, most of this clip factor is going to end up becoming tiny. And having clip factor be too high was my problem. I can probably even boost that more, probably won't help. We might have it here to a point where now nuke practically doesn't do anything other than increase the intent. But I'm, I'm shooting for making it crank out the highs a lot. That's what we're trying to do is crank out the highs a lot without having it being overly loud on the subs. So we're scaling this factor around. We've got our, our thump with the audio. Like I said, it is going to be susceptible to how loud the peaks are. So low gain, not as much of a boost. And we make it jump up into the mid-range by doing that. This will be the same at higher frequencies. Loud noises make it zoop up. And lastly, our nuke now does this. We expected that. And we're starting to get okay we might be able to live with this but we don't know how it works on other frequencies yet we only know that it is turning this series of uh, strange artifact adding boosts into a complete psycho nightmare But this almost sounds like Berlin Techno right there. That's kind of cool. You could totally make Berlin Techno out of this. And... Crank it up all the way, see if it works. And this is working better. Except we're still dying away. Like here is our band pass at a super high frequency. But if we turn up nuke, it's not going into that overload zone. It's becoming quiet. That's not what I had in mind. I was looking to get this, but in the highs. So we're not done. We're going to maybe simplify this a little bit by doing it as part of an algorithm. By quad A to the power of 3 should be the same as by quad A times by quad A times by quad A. This by quad A to the power of 2 would be by quad A times by quad A. 
So this is um, what we just had, and if we change it to four, it's going to be the same as continuing to stack up those. And let's leave it at 64 just to see what, well, I don't know, though, that's going to make the, the end result a lot smaller. So let's simply double it. Because what we're doing here is taking this behavior and trying to voice it. We're trying to make the voice of how the thing works act in certain ways. And I'm trying to make this boosty effect, this increasing gain effect. And thankfully, we only have to do this calculation once per buffer. So that's handy. So we got this going on. You know what? Stray thought. Let's see what we get out of making it go even lower in maximum lowness of frequency. This gets smaller and smaller the lower it goes, but any little thing is forcing it upwards in pitch. So if we start it off at an incredibly low subsonic frequency, that might change the voicing of our rumble in an interesting and useful way. And again, like I said, we're only doing this power factor once per buffer. We call it, it reads the controls, it looks at this here. It does this, I could do 304 for that matter. But then every sample, it doesn't have to recalculate that every time. Well, let's see what we got. I got another 50 or so minutes of streaming to do before running around and checking on some other stuff that I got to do. I'm still working on that hot water heater that's going run. And I'm in the middle of doing laundry, as I said. I could stop and change my laundry over, but I'll do that later. Bro77, hello. You're hearing something distressing. Is it like this? Now that, that is a Berlin Techno subsonic rumble, if ever I heard one. I am pleased with that. And as we get higher in frequency, It's still dying away real aggressively when I go higher in frequency. Yeah, like, I feel like this kind of horrible madness should also be happening in the higher frequency ranges, and it's just not. We need more gain. We need more gain up here. So what we need to do, we can do that in a number of ways, but the way I'm doing it is probably fine. I just haven't gotten aggressive enough with it. So let's get aggressive, but let's get aggressive in a particular kind of way. Here's where we're getting this number. It goes to 0 0.5 at the highest possible frequency at the lowest possible sample rate. And the more we multiply it by itself, the smaller it's going to get. So if we multiply it by itself eight times instead of four times, this should probably stifle all of that crazy rumbly stuff down incredibly much. And if I don't then multiply it back up again, it should remain very damp down. Basically what I'm shooting for is, can I make it so that all of that stuff is just as suppressed as the high frequency stuff is? Because if I can do that, then maybe I can turn everything up to compensate 
and basically get it so that the curves are matching and get it so that the bandpass going into the high frequencies and cranking up the nuke starts doing crazy stuff up in the highs too. That's what I'm shooting for, especially since this insane going of the uh, sound behavior is making stuff go higher in frequency. So in theory, if I can make it full of artifacts and go completely bonkers high in frequency on high frequency sounds, it'll make them incredibly gnarly and trashy because it'll basically be replacing the sound entirely with just artifacts. But one thing at a time. Let's first see if we can force it into well-behaved behavior. Kind of. See, one of the things about frequency is if I don't have any frequencies up there, they're not going to get boosted. I could be testing this with white noise and maybe that'd be a good idea. Wow, okay, I didn't see that coming. No matter how much I tamp this thing down, it's still totally doing it. Maybe that's just because that's happening on the very first... But no, it can't be, can it? Because... Here's an idea. I've got fifth here, right? This is a slider I'm not doing anything with. Let's go and do something with it. Get prem, prem five. Check this one out. Now, clip factor is always one or more, unless I have this control turned down to be less than one. If clip factor is zero, all of my amplitude goes to nothing. And if, uh, this is going to be an interesting experiment. Let's just dial this stuff in with knobs. I said I was going to maybe do that. So that's now a much higher number. And that one starts at one, and this one should start at, uh, well, if it's low, it won't matter. So this gives me the rough area. I can start it at nothing and nothing will happen. Here's my param five and six coming into action briefly to let me dial this stuff in. And since this gets applied over and over again with each stage of filtering, that's why this comes in handy being able to dial it in. So five at one is previous behavior. Six at something or other is previous behavior. Six at zero means we have no boost at all. Here's our audio. So with this, no additional emphasis on freak, but we have all this rumble. Now, okay, that was amusing. Didn't expect that. Hello, we have a new behavior. Okay, this is interesting. Now what that should have done is when you turn it down, 
we start multiplying stuff by less than one, making it go quieter. But that's not what it did, was it? Instead, it turns it into a note, a loud note, too. That tells me that the way this whole thing is interacting, Nuke starts doing weird stuff. Like if I take this out, well, no, I still hear it a little bit. This is completely overwhelmed what the frequency thing was doing. That said, it's kind of cool. Because again, this being all the way up, we got the previous behavior again. But just sneak it back a tiniest amount. All of a sudden, we're up in the high frequencies. And Nuke can do nothing. So what do we have when we start sneaking it up again? Oh, interesting. We're still stuck on slow changes to the controls. <laughs> Look at this. It's not responding at all. Is my option key stuck down somehow? No, now it's better. Now we had sixths also available. What happens when we move that? It should be doing something. Because if it's at zero, it's making all of this literally be zero. Uh, this plus literally nothing. So we should be able to get more out of this. Let's start fooling around a little bit more. Remember how we took this and said, add it to power by quad zero comma eight from four. And that made the slope of the thing change very drastically. Let's put it back to four. Param three, of course, is nuke. Param six is the amount that we're applying all of this. But param six is also the maximum amount we can apply anything to. So if we have six cranked up all the way, it will be a number of 2048 that we are able to apply combined with the amount of nuke and combined with the scaling factor. So we should be going from we don't need anywhere near 0 0.9 on that I think. So now we have a more flexible way of moving that. And let's see. That's enough changes for now. We are getting some interesting effects out of all this. It's just a question of which directions we can take it. We should also throw alien kittens at it and see what it does with loud noises. Because this doesn't count as loud noises. I 
Uh, let's take six back down again. Seems to do nothing. This is shifting everything up in pitch a lot. It still does nothing. See, what I'm shooting for is I'm trying to get this whole adjustment thing to go so that we can take these high frequencies. Oh, hang on. Spoke too soon. There we go. This is what we we're shooting for, is setting up the thing so that we turn the frequency up and on full nuke, it would still do horrible things. This is the pay dirt. This is what we're trying to do. So why do we have this dead zone? Not much happening here at all. It gets very aggressive there and there. Let's address that by taking down the power factor even more. If we can find it, we can, it's here. Take it down to a factor of two, because what's happening when we have the power factor be really high here is that the closer we get to the extreme highs, the more crazy bonkers insane it goes. Trouble is, we had it so that it was going crazy bonkers insane at super, super high frequencies, but then it would cut back out again, meaning that our, our taper was too intense. This has also just increased the gain of everything loads, but that never hurt anybody, as long as my monitor speakers aren't turned up too loud. Otherwise, it could hurt all kinds of things. Hey, Bo. Doing all right, a little bit under the weather after all that VST making, but uh, working on X uh, mid-range, X band pass. Okay, that's lots of gain. Let's delicately add a little bit of this. Hey, pay dirt. Hear this? We're getting artifacts up here with lots of added nuke. And it's still nasty all the way down to here. Although it's kind of continuing to ramp up down here too, and that's not great. Like, we still want to dial this back. So basically what I'm wrestling with now is this range seems fairly acceptable. Like you can take this and fool with this and if it's on full nuke, which is meant to be about as uncontrollable as they get, we can get crazy overtones here. 
and slide them around and still get crazy overtones up in the highs. to the point of nasty, ugly noises. And again, you can do chiller, more mellow things. Distort it into it, say. But my challenge is when I get down into the lower frequency ranges, the gain goes overwhelming. So let's see whether we can maybe throw in an additional calculating factor that's just about the uh, multiple bands of nuke. And what I'm thinking of is something tied to the frequency, but not quite the same as we had it before. Yes, it is going to be a band pass. That's why it's called X band pass. Sorry, that was rude. Gotta watch out, maybe sometimes I'll snipe at you if the question seems obvious. And thunder control. And we're going to look at using just plain get parameter param2 for this. That's going to go from 1 to 0. No attempt to convert this into a uh, biquad. And there will become a question of scaling it somehow. In fact, Thunder Control could also be used to boost higher frequencies under some settings as well. But my thinking is... Adjust the levels here. Where's compensation coming from? Oh, same deal. This is going to be... Oh, compensation is the opposite of that, huh? And it's being applied everywhere. Another scaling, and I have no idea what you mean by delta function. You can explain it. It might not actually get in there, though. Oh, we're not going to want to do that. Oh, I'm going to do a notch filter. This isn't it, but there is going to be a notch filter. I'm definitely curious to see what that does. We'll be seeing it maybe next week if this one goes well. Uh, good enough. I'm not worried about making that pretty. I'm worried about seeing what it does. It is very effective at taking the volume down. Whew. 
Oh boy, is it ever. It's all too effective at that. So we don't need this control as much as it is. We are killing our output volume incredibly effectively with that. It's just, it's controlling everything into the stratosphere. Oh, we can also make a thunder noise. That's amusing. How about let's not do that and we'll figure out another way of doing this. How about half as much of that? Because it seems as if without it, it's an enormous effect. With it, it is a tiny effect. So, plus. This also means we can now scale the gain of going into the high frequency stuff by just having this be times 0 0.7 or whatever. The whole thing can be doctored in this way. And it's only taking place at one point. It's only taking place on the very input gain of all of this. Let's see what we get. Back into the breach. We're still cutting gain an awful lot. It's definitely not supposed to cut gain that much. Tell you what. Seventh and eighth can come into play. We're doing all this stuff with these un unlabeled things. Five and six. Seven. And eight. This is where stuff starts getting a little complicated. I just got to remember I'm going to be wanting to take all of these out when I've got my numbers for them. So here we go. That should now be back to as if it wasn't happening. <laughs> Alrighty then. Interesting. Well, heck, if we can control this, it'll be cool. Hmm. 
Nook, you're drunk. Well, if you can tame this, it'll be cool. By all means, sample off of my stream if you're enjoying this. Okay, this wants to be turned up. Any little motion of this control is throwing an enormous amount of stuff in here. Okay, seven and eight. What's going on with these guys? That's not actually making anything happen. Okay, what's really going on here? We're making thunder control. Should be able to make it be one plus nothing. Assuming, of course, that these parameters are what I think they are. Yep, 0 through 10, going from 1 to 0 every time. So that should be predictable enough. What is going on with adding this one thing that should be settable to 1? Like, let's just go back and see if it was something else. I should not be able to do that now. Because I took that bit out. Yep, all the gain. This is still here, and then if I add, if I turn Freak down enough, we start getting to this zone where too much gain. But if I added a gain factor here, it was no good. Well, one thing going on there was that we're doing clip factor, which is adjusting this stuff, but this is effectively in the middle of the filter. So it seems like adjusting the loudness of things inside the filter can cause craziness to happen. Let's do something a little radical and see what happens. So, you know, that should not do anything. But if we moved these, oh wait, that does nothing. Well, okay, doesn't matter. I have a way to fix it. See, what might be going on is we should never be doing this. We should never be changing out samples gain inside the filter but it might be worthwhile to input sample is what's coming in. Input sample times clip factor, and input sample is where we would be boosting into additional levels of filter. Uh, bro, 
I honestly don't know. Uh, I know that those aren't mine, so... I'm trying to think, because I've run into that problem before. I had to do stuff to cope with it. Um, are those 32-bit plugins by any chance? And are they not being found or are they not passing validation? Meanwhile, let me do this. Only one of those, thank you. Now this might be giving us something that sounds completely different. So let's see. This stuff still engaged, except for I'm pretty sure this is not. Seven and eight are nothing. Five and six are still alive. Interesting. We got something going on here. And of course, six is my boost. Up here. Interesting. This is starting to feel like something that works. get when we do this. What do we get when we do this? There's this mid-range gap in here, like, get this, with all of this nuke on so that it's just many levels of processing, I can get a hell of a boost here. That's mid-range. That should be loud as hell, but it's not. And then we can still get our excessively loud. If we zero this, what happens? Hmm. 
I have every intention of trying to do an X-notch filter. We'll see how well it works, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. That may be, if all goes well, that might even be uh, next week. We'll see. See, distortion, distortion, not a. And fifth is at zero. If I turn this up, we start getting the super boost at the bottom. If I don't, we don't. Well, one of the things I know about this is this has to do with the rate of boost. Like the more times I multiply a frequency by itself, the more it will make everything but the very highest frequencies uh, go into super distortion. So when I'm doing this, that's because I'm overemphasizing those super highs. If I was to tone that back down a little bit, I'd be able to get distortion here. So let's try revoicing that. This adjustment of the, the gain going into it seems to be helping a little bit. It'll probably work even better for um, the Y factor ones. And it may or may not even be a relevant thing to do. I'm not sure if I'm gonna to try to do it with uh, X high pass, other than maybe revisiting that for Y high pass and forward. Cause X pass, X high pass has its own gnarly characteristic going on. It's pretty aggressive and that might be worth keeping around. So let's see. We had, uh, I think param five ended up being zero plus these other things. I can leave that alone, I guess. Um, compensation is definitely a factor. Mm. Clip factor is definitely a factor. Oh, I think param 5 wasn't able to go all the way down to nothing because I've got it scaling between 0 0.9 and 0 0.1. Thunder control can be taken out almost entirely that way. In fact, it might be worth, let's comment this out for a moment. Let's see if we can dial it in without it. That's an extra correction. Maybe we don't need it. Let's dial a uh, clip factor gets to go down to 0 0.5 each time. And pal by quad A times by quad A. If we didn't have that, how would it do? This is our overall scaling factor, which we can scale right up or down as much as we want. And param three, of course, is nuke. This might get us into the zone. Let's see what we get. Hopefully I can get some progress pretty quick because after all of that VST grinding, uh, and I would have done all of them if I could. I went as far as I could until I just couldn't do any more. So I do need to also take it easy some of these days. What do we got? Wow, that's loud. Okay, that's the opposite of what I had. And of course, this is the overall grind. I'm satisfied with how nasty that is. And this should be able to give me
boost. So if I dial this back, hello. And then we restrain nuke. I've been working with the Silicon Mac for all that VST stuff. I've been recompiling everything with it. I've done virtually nothing but grindy grunt work that's pain in the butt with it. So it's a little hard to tell. I mean, it's, it's very exciting how much battery life it gets. I just plug it in every now and then and then just go for hours. I have done almost nothing other than just grueling Xcode work and all that code signing stuff with it. So hard to tell, really. If all this goes well enough, I could end up getting one for doing my regular stuff with. I think I'm getting happy with this. That's cool. Okay, this is what I wanted all along. Okay, well, in all seriousness, if you're thinking about getting one yourself, I would say yes, absolutely. There is uh, stuff that I'm still looking to see as far as catching up with running things like OBS and so on and so forth. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm exactly at the point of being able to take everything that I do and translate it over to the new Macs. But it's getting closer and closer. If anything, I'm waiting for a more, I'm waiting for another processor generation. It's like, okay, how about MX, you know, M2? I want to see where they take that because there's going to be further crazy surprises. Like this situation is essentially exploding in Apple land. Their stuff is going to get so powerful, it's just outlandish. And that's because they're doing this M1 stuff first. And if they're able to make it outperform the previous things they were doing so intensely, then stuff's going to get kind of silly. So on the one hand, you could say, yeah, get one. On the other hand, you could say, wait for when they do the really spectacular things. Or like the, if you if you got, say, a Mac Mini, that outperforms almost everything else. <laughs> it's just like that outperforms like previous, like the, the laptop outperforms my iMac Pro on some things. If I'm running like Minecraft and I run the unofficial but Apple Silicon compiled version of Minecraft and stuff, the iMac Pro, which was way too expensive with, um, you know, 18 processors and all that stuff. It's great for certain things, certainly, but it'll get me like uh, 150 frames per second in Minecraft, which is way more than any previous Mac I ever had would do. And then the um, the laptop, which is just the first M1s coming out, gets me like 180. Certain things the the new processors are just silly good at. So it's not likely going to hurt you terribly much even getting the first. 
Let's get back to playing with this. We were getting some real... Real effects. Okay, that's an effective nuke. And this is behaving itself real nicely. Now, one of the things going on with this is that this control, sixths, is the maximum amount of boost that I have on fully nuked out craziness. So with uh, it all the way down, we can have a very simple effect. And then the more we add, the crazier it gets. This control tells us how much of that, like if I go from 0 0.41 to like twice as much, complete overload. So the question becomes, how much of that do I want to include in it? back like this on the lows because I don't think I need to dial it back on the lows anymore. It's balancing pretty well. We do have it cutting the level back when it does this, and that's useful. Very quickly goes insane, though. Uh, hello, okay. Now we're starting to get some sense out of it, because when I do this, I can dial this back so that the highs aren't going crazy, and then when I go down, the lows are still going crazy. See, full nuke high is not going too crazy, but... So we still have some tweaking to do here. First, this control here that's marked fifth is going to help me rail in, rein in the super low frequencies things. So it does this. And then what sixth does is that gives me the gain on and remember, I'm boosting gain into it as well, so that is also doing a thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Ugh. Yeah, let's adjust the range of that too while we're at it. When I say let's adjust the range of that, what I mean is get param 5, let's not have it go 0 0.5 to 1. 
let's have it go from zero to one like this. See, so our super low is here, can be dialed back to nothing. Let's have this at exactly 0 0.5. We can always boost later. So what do we get when we have these super subsonics? The actual amplitude is more like this. On full nuke, we could dial it back to that much. And then it's roughly the same volume level, no matter how much nuke is on, as long as you're not distorting into it. And I feel like that is probably a decent choice. And then when we go up in frequency, I don't know though, I feel like maybe a certain amount of insanity on full nuke would be good. So if we were on low frequency, let's take all that stuff right up to the point of complete overload and ridiculousness, but not beyond. Like rather than having it set up to just crank like this, We can have it doing stuff like that. Full nuke will get us additional boost that way. And it's peaking out but not going too totally crazy. And then in the high frequencies, this comes into play. So let's Very sensitive adjustment here. We can make this noise happen just by itself. Just go swoop. That's just the biquad filter doing that. Quite loudly too. So let's see. Full nuke means being able to distort everything real aggressively. Let's maybe raise the thunder up a little bit too while we're at it. To real aggressive without spiking too insanely far. And of course, if we move it around inside here, it will make it spike and do terrible things. 
And of course, let's nuke. It's more manageable, but you can always distort into it. Okay. This is coming together. And if that's too much nuke, we'll pull it back a little bit. We do have that extra gain in there, but that's because those drums are sitting around those frequencies. We can dial it back and have our bandpass throw a certain amount of lasery goodness in, but only to this extent. And of course, dry wet. Alrighty. I think we have a working X band pass that I can let people have this coming Sunday. That's cool. Here, it's going to fire up again in a moment. It's quite a result, too. This is apparently how to add a, synth a synthetic kick to your drum tracks with X band pass. There's your synthetic kick, even sustains. Here's our subs. Pretty respectable set of subs. I don't have anything that will sync into tempo, so probably not. However, if you were okay with just throwing other stuff in, look into the uh, square wave tremolo that I did not so long ago. I did a tremolo that does zero crossings. It watches for zero crossings uh, to turn its gate on and off. So it has a particular tonality to it. Uh, I forget exactly what that, what's going on with that one. In any case, I'm going to make note of these settings and uh, set this guy up to give to you folks this coming Sunday. Should be good. On that note, I will say goodbye for today. Talk to you folks later.
，拜拜。